So, in the last class, uh, we had considered the um, back propagation algorithm derivation from a mathematical point of view and uh, today we are going to see some of the practical aspects of back propagation algorithm. Right. Now, you have seen in the last class that uh, the local gradient that we are having, uh, I mean for the output as well as for the um, uh, hidden layer neurons, that local gradient is very much dependent upon the derivative of the activation function because it is proportional to phi dash of V g. So, this necessarily means that phi dash v j should be computable. That means to say that one of the fundamental conditions that we are imposing, uh, I mean for back propagation algorithm to work is that the activation functions that we consider must be uh, continuous and they should be differentiable. Okay. Unless we have that, the back propagation uh, algorithm cannot work because in, in such cases, phi dash v j will simply become undefined, phi dash v j will not exist if that is not the case. Okay. So, I mean coming to the question of activation functions to be used in the back propagation algorithm, certainly the activation functions like McCulloch and Pitts model okay, or the signum function, they are ruled out. Okay, because they are necessarily becoming uh, discontinuous function. Okay. At the point v is equal to 0, the function becomes discontinuous if we are considering any one of those kind of functions. So, instead we should again concentrate our attention to the continuous activation functions for which the typical examples that we considered were the sigmoidal nonlinear functions. Okay. And for sigmoidal functions, okay, the uh, two kind of models that we are taking are the logistic sigmoidal function and the tan hyperbolic sigmoidal function. Logistic is in the range of 0 to 1, whereas the uh, tan hyperbolic is in the range of minus 1 to plus 1. Right. So, let us consider first the case of logistic um, uh, activation function and we will derive that what is the uh, local gradient that we can compute considering a logistic function. right? And then we will go over to some of the other practical considerations like what is the um, uh, effect, I mean like every time we are presenting any neural network algorithm, we have to debate upon the point that what should be the right kind of choice for the ETAs that is the learning rate. Okay. We have been telling about compromise that it should not be too large, it should not be too high, but I mean uh, some uh, uh, I mean research efforts were put in uh, I mean during the late 80s whereby I mean uh, one can make the algorithm stable as well as uh, I mean cause uh, I mean quicker convergence for it, right. So, that is uh, that will be discussed immediately thereafter and then we will try to compare about the two modes of learning that is the batch mode and the um, 
and what you can call as the um, uh, sequential mode of learning okay, for the case of back propagation. So, these are the things which I intend to cover in today's class. So, let me first uh, give, uh, I mean consider the activation functions for back propagation network okay, in which I am going to consider the example of the sigmoidal function and especially the logistic function. Okay. So, we consider that as the phi function we have the logistic function defined as follows. Since we are considering the neuron g, so for the neuron g the logistic function phi of g as a function of v j n okay, is going to be 1 by 1 plus exponential to the power minus a times v j of n where you know that uh, as before A is controlling the slope of the uh, activation <coughs> function and V j n is nothing but the uh, induced local field that is a summation of the inputs times the weight. I mean weighted summation of all the inputs will be the V j. Okay. So, the definition remains the same only. In this case, certainly the conditions that we are imposing is that A is greater than 0 and V j that we are considering okay, can be anywhere in the range of minus infinity to plus infinity. Okay. We are not putting any restriction on the bounds of V j in this case. Okay. Now, uh, um, I, I mean if we consider a logistic function like this, in that case we can take the derivative of this logistic function. So, let us compute this phi dash j v j n which means to say that what we have to do is to take the derivative of this function with respect to v j. Okay. So, that is going to be fairly simple and easy enough. Okay. What will happen is that the denominator term will now become a squared term. Right? The denominator will become a squared term and in the numerator we will be getting the differential of the uh, denominator term and then the numerator term which is 1 product of that. So, that means to say that the, that the differential of this term only will be there which means to say that we are going to get the uh, derivative as a times exponential to the power minus a v j n. Okay, by 1 plus exponential to the power minus a v j n okay, this term square. Right. So, this is going to be the derivative. In fact, this phi j that we are writing can also be written as y j because that is going to be the net output. So, if this is y j in that case 1 minus y j if we consider 1 minus y j will become exponential to the power this term by 1 plus exponential uh, or 1 plus I mean exponential of this term whole square. Uh, uh, so, uh, no I mean 1 by 1 I mean that is exponential of this by this. So, that is going to be 1 minus y j. In fact, I mean this whole thing could be expressed as a times y j n multiplied by, so this also is y j n. So, a times y j n times 1 minus y j n. All right. So, this is going to be our equation number 1. So, this is phi dash j v j of n which is equal to this. So, this we are calling as equation number 1 for today. Right. So, now uh, for a neuron that is located in the output layer. Okay. So, if j, if neuron j is in output layer, in that case we can simply write that y j n is equal to o j of n. Okay. I mean o j of n being the output. Okay. So, y j is the final output and in, in that case the local gradient that is delta j n will be equal to what e j times 
phi dash j n right. So, this is E j at iteration n times phi dash j v j n and what is phi dash n if we are considering the logistic function. Yeah, so uh, first of all that E j n could be expressed as simply d j n minus y j n that is right. So, it is d j n minus y j n that is going to be E j n not y j n because we are considering y j n to be the uh, output only. So, which is o j n. So, it is d j n minus o j n times it will be y j n into 1 minus y j n. I mean that is what we had already derived. So, this is going to be instead of y j o j we can write. So, it is o j n into 1 minus o j n. Please verify. Is it correct? So, this is the phi dash j term okay, that we are writing. In fact, phi dash j will be a times o j n into 1 minus o j n okay, and e j n is going to be d j minus o j n. Right? So, this is I mean what we have got is the correct expression for delta j n that is the local gradient. And if j is a hidden layer neuron, In such case, what will be the expression for our delta j n? Delta j n is will be equal to what? <coughs> Remember our discussion from the last class? Phi, phi j n or phi dash j n, phi dash j n multiplied by summation, summation of what? <laughs> summation of all the delta terms, the weighted summation of the delta terms in the output layer and that weighted summation will be over k, where k is the output uh, layer neurons. So, k is the index for output neuron. So, what we are going to have is phi dash j that means to say this neuron j which is under consideration v j n okay, times summation of delta k n w k j that is correct delta k n w k j n and this summation is over k. Okay. Simply what we can substitute is that instead of phi dash j v j n, we can write it as a multiplied by in this case y j n only we have to write. Right? We cannot write o j n because o j n is the output, okay. but in this case y j n will be the uh, output of the jth neuron, I mean the hidden neuron. So, we have to write here y j n only into 1 minus y j n. So, that is the term that we are writing in place of the derivative of the activation function and the summation of the, the, the weighted summation of all the uh, local gradients at the output will remain as before. That means to say that it will be summation of delta k n w k j n where it is summed up over k and this is for the case of hidden layer neuron. Okay. Whereas, for the case of uh, um, the uh, um, uh, I mean output layer, this is the expression that we have got. This is for the output layer, okay. whereas this is for the hidden layer. All right. Anybody having any doubts or confusion pertaining to this? No. All right. So, now uh, let us uh, look at uh, this that uh, I mean after all we have derived our expression for phi dash j in okay, phi dash j. So, let us have a look at this expression. Okay. In fact, we have computed phi dash and phi dash in turn is controlling our delta j that is the local gradient. Now, uh, first of all that what is going to be the range of y j according to this uh, activation function? Can anybody say? What is the range of y j? Plus 1 to minus 1, everybody agrees? 0 to, 0 to plus 1, 0 to 1 it is. Okay. 
because you see that uh, I mean it's very easy to see that I mean uh, you 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 don't have to uh, remember it I mean even if you just simply have a look at this expression you can see that what is the bounds on this term I mean v j could be minus infinity to plus infinity as I said now if I if I consider the case of v j n tending to minus infinity then it is exponential to the power infinite okay which means to say that the denominator term is becoming infinite so it is 0 y j n is equal to 0 whereas the other extreme is when v j becomes infinity okay tends to infinity in that case it is exponential to the power minus infinity which means to say that this term is 0 this exponential term is 0 so it is uh, uh, 1 at the output so here I mean the way we have written the formula okay our y j I mean that is to say considering this kind of a logistic function okay our y j is bound is going to be in the range of 0 and 1 okay. So, certainly you all agree about the bounds of y j. Now, <coughs> if I ask you that uh, you try to plot I mean consider this expression 1 okay and try to uh, find out that how this phi dash j function changes with the y j definitely phi dash j is dependent upon y j. So, how is it dependent where are we going to have the maximum value of phi dash j 1 by 2, One by two. yes that means to say that when y j is equal to 0 0.5 okay in that case we are going to get the maximum value of phi dash j and what is the value of phi dash j when y j is equal to 1 0 simply substitute here it is 0 what happens when you take y j equal to 0 then also it is 0 so that means to say that for y j equal to 1 or for y j equal to 0 this equation 1 gives us a value of 0 for the derivative. So, that means to say that in those places the derivative of the activation function becomes 0 and when we have y j is equal to 0 0.5 that means to say that exactly at the mid range of y there we are going to have the value of phi dash v j to be the maximum right. I mean you can simply differentiate this phi dash j with respect to y j and see it yourself I mean by uh, I mean equating the derivative to 0 you can find out the point of maximum is certainly becoming at y j n is equal to 0 0.5. So, that means to say that the phi dash v j is definitely maxim being maximum at the mid range of y that means to say that the weight adjustments that we are going to do that is to say ultimately we are going to do a delta w j i based on this computation is not it based on phi dash j or based on the delta j ok we are going to find out the delta w k, k j ok and that weight changes I mean those weight changes will be maximum when we have y j n equal to 0.5 or rather to say at the mid range of the output values the weight adjustment is becoming maximum. In fact, this is one uh, thing about it okay, which uh, I mean definitely adds to the stability of using such kind of logistic function in the back propagation network. Now, very similarly okay, in a very similar way we can show that instead of taking a logistic function if I had taken a tan hyperbolic function okay, I could have derived a very similar expression to that okay. only thing is that there instead of taking 1 by 1 plus exponential to the power minus a v j n I should have taken tan hyperbolic of a v j n okay. and then I could have computed a very similar expression. So, I am not going into the computation of that okay. there should be something that should be left to the students as well as the viewers for them to solve. Okay. So, the tan hyperbolic case 
you can consider and solve it yourself. Okay. It will be quite easy following the uh, same lines you can derive the expressions for phi dash j and correspondingly the delta j considering j to be the output layer neuron and j to be a hidden layer neuron. So, that is as far as the <coughs> activation functions considerations are there okay, which we have now derived out of this okay. and then the next point to consider is the uh, rate of learning okay, because in the expression that we had got okay, as before I mean remember the expression that we had got in the last class about the change of weight that is delta w k j. Delta w k j is dependent upon what terms remember it is dependent upon eta. So, that is equal to eta times delta j times times y. Okay. So, now what we have to do is that definitely that means to say that it is dependent on eta. Now, I mean we have been discussing about etas okay, all the time. In this case you see that uh, the back propagation algorithm that we have got in this case is definitely an approximation to the steepest descent problem. I mean this is also a solution of the steepest descent only, okay. but, uh, but in this case it is an approximated version of the steepest descent. And approximated version of the steepest descent means that in the case of a perfect steepest descent, we know that see ultimately what is it that is happening in the case of the steepest descent algorithm. We start with some value of weight vector, right. So, we are in some m dimensional space initially, we are having we are in some point in the m dimensional space okay, with the initial set of weights okay. and then we are going to move in the weight space m dimensional weight space and we will follow a, follow a trajectory a trajectory that ultimately takes us to some value of weight which we have been calling so long as the w star vector okay. and w star vector is something where it gives the uh, minimum value of the cost function that we have been considering and the trajectory in the case of a uh, steepest descent algorithm is going to be a smooth trajectory. So, since the back propagation network back propagation algorithm is an approximation to the steepest descent, okay, certainly the trajectory that we are going to follow out there in the m dimensional space is not going to be a smooth trajectory. Okay, the trajectory is very much dependent upon eta and as our discussion has gone in the case of the single layer perceptron also that there is a trade off that is definitely going to exist. You make eta too small okay, then what happens is that the learning is getting too small, but the trajectory will be smooth and you will not have the you will not run the risk of having a, uh, an instability, okay, the system will be always stable. Whereas, if you are making eta to be too large, okay, then the learning definitely will be faster, but the risk is that we can, uh, I mean it can lead to an instability. Okay. So, now there were researchers okay, to find out that if there could be any solution to this, that means to say having a faster uh, learning and also a better stability condition okay, or rather to say a guaranteed stability condition is that possible. So, now what happens is that in this effort okay, some researches were done and as I was telling you that most of the developments in the uh, multilayer perceptron and so to say about the back propagation uh, algorithm. Uh, etcetera were done in the 80s and uh, it was the uh, book by Rummelhert in 1986, the book on parallel distributed processing which we had mentioned a few classes back. 
in that book it was presented okay, that one of the solutions to have both together that means to say stability as well as faster learning is uh, to add what is called as a momentum term to the learning and using the momentum term which was actually suggested by Rummel Hurt, okay, there the delta W g i that we are going to have delta W g i at iteration n is going to be equal to alpha times delta W g i n minus 1 plus our usual learning term that exists that means to say eta, eta being the learning rate times delta j n which is the uh, <coughs> I mean local gradient times y i n, y i n being the input to the neuron j. So, here this term is very familiar to us, okay. this is the normal learning term that we always have whereas, this is something which is new to us, we have not come across this term earlier. So, this is an addition and just see that here what is the significance of that, that means to say that the change of weight that you are doing is in some way proportional to the change of weight that you had done in the earlier iteration. Okay. That means to say in the n minus 1 th iteration whatever delta w j i you had considered you are taking a proportion of that okay, to be added up. So, in this case alpha is going to be a constant. Okay. In fact, uh, alpha is normally taken to be a positive number okay, and alpha is referred to as the momentum constant, momentum constant. In fact, why is it called a momentum? I mean if you spend a bit of time on it, okay, I think it is very easy to understand. That means to say that over and above your normal learning, okay, you can afford to have eta to be small because we know that eta small is good from the stability consideration. So, despite having small eta, okay, we can uh, have a quicker learning as if to say giving it a push, okay. giving it a push that means to say that applying an external force and force as we know okay, will be causing a momentum. So, definitely there is every reason to call it as a momentum term. So, which is added to this delta W j i. Now, this in fact, I mean this equation that we have got over here could be written in terms of, of this that W delta W j i n, I mean in the form of a difference equation if we write, then we have to write it as delta W g i n minus delta uh, minus alpha times delta W g i n minus 1 which should be equal to eta times delta j n y j n, okay. which means to say that very similarly we are going to have delta w j i n minus 1 minus alpha times delta w j i n minus 2 is equal to eta times delta j n minus 1 y j n minus 1, is not it. I mean if we had written the same expression for the earlier iteration. The, the difference equation for earlier iteration would have been like this. So, which means to say that if somebody tells me, I mean like this we can go on, is not it? I mean like this we can go on for uh, n minus 2, n minus 3 and so on up to I mean uh, n uh, I mean up to n minus n that is uh, w g i 0 which means to say the initial. We can go there and uh, if we have to eliminate all these intermediate terms, let us say that if we have to uh, eliminate this uh, delta w g i n minus 1 term, simply what we have to do is to multiply the second equation okay, by alpha, is not it. So, if I multiply this whole equation, this second equation by alpha, then what I am getting is alpha times delta W j i minus here it becomes alpha square. Okay. 
So, if I add up this 2 on the left hand side, it is delta W g i n minus alpha squared times delta W g i n minus 2, which is going to be equal to eta delta j n y j n plus alpha times eta delta j n minus 1 into, n, uh, into y j n minus 1. We can shift the, uh, I mean delta W g i term on the delta W g i n minus 2 term on the uh, right hand side. From left hand side, we can uh, take it to the right hand side and in that case, delta W g i n will become alpha square delta W j i uh, n minus 2 okay, plus it is going to be eta times delta j n okay, y j n. Uh, oh, here, here it is going to be eta alpha okay, plus eta alpha this term. In fact, if we keep on doing it, then I mean here we have expressed it in terms of n minus 2, but ultimately if we add up everything n minus 2, n minus 3, n minus 4 and all that, in that case the delta j i n is going to be expressible as a time series. Okay. So, we can I mean you can verify this yourself by proceeding with the difference equation solving approach that we are ultimately going to get delta w j i n to be equal to eta times summation t is equal to 0 to n alpha to the power n minus t into delta j t times y i t. Okay. This is something that is going to express it. Eta is a constant, okay. eta is not varying with iteration. Alpha is also a constant, but here why I had to put alpha term inside the uh, summation is because it is alpha to the power n minus something, okay, n minus t. And in this case, t is the quantity that is changing. That means to say that considering t is equal to n, okay, it is alpha to the power 0. So, it is delta j n, eta delta j n y i n, the first term. Then t is equal to n minus 1. I mean, if you look at it from a reverse way, t is equal to n minus 1 means it is alpha to the power 1, delta j n minus 1, y i n minus 1, the term that we were writing out here okay, for the second equation. And like this, it is a summation series that is ultimately going to be. So, this is a time series representation of delta w j i n. Okay. Okay. So, this is a time series. So, this is a time series representation, time series representation and <coughs> what is the length of the time series? Length of time series is in this case n plus 1. Okay. Now, simply what we can do is that we already know that delta j times y i is going to be equal to the negative of dou e dou w j i. Okay. I mean, is not it the rate of change of the error function with respect to, I mean error with respect to, I mean the cost function with respect to the change of weight. So, I can express this same equation as delta w j i n equal to minus eta times summation t is equal to 0 to n alpha to the power n minus t into dou e t dou w j i t. Okay. So, this is going to be our series representation. Okay. Now, we can spend little bit of time on it and find out about the convergence aspect of this equation. You see, we are considering the alpha to be a positive quantity. right? Now, 
the thing is that we can take I mean we, we never said that we have to put the alpha term to be a uh, I mean alpha term is greater than 1 or alpha term is less than 1 that one we have not really specified. So, firstly that uh, um, uh, here we have to know I mean one consideration which should be there for us is that the alpha term that we have to take should be definitely within 0 and 1 okay. because one thing is there that you can make out from this series itself that if I put alpha to be greater than 1 then delta W G i term will be uncontrollable I mean it will increase because uh, as the power of alpha increases if alpha is greater than 1 then the contribution of these terms which are getting summed up will increase and definitely that will be uncontrollable. So, that is not the uh, not something that we are looking for in this case. So, uh, definitely we restrict the range of alpha to be this that within 0 and 1. Now, if it is within 0 and 1 then one thing is very sure that this expression that we are getting okay, alpha to the power n minus t into dou e dou uh, w j i okay, this is uh, surely going to be a convergent series okay, because with uh, I mean alpha less than 1 I mean modulus of alpha being less than 1 it is going to be convergent and there is some uh, consideration that we can have on this dou e dou w j i term. Now, this term definitely we are having n plus 1 such terms is not it and they are getting added up with the uh, value of this alpha to the power n minus t. Now, if it so happens now alpha is positive in this case. Okay. Uh, now, in this case if this dou e dou uh, w j i is having the same sign in every iteration for every t if it is having the same sign in that case the modulus of delta w j i is going to be a higher value is not it. I mean although it will be convergent, but modulus of delta w j i okay, grows in magnitude. So, I can say that uh, if dou e dou w j i okay, has the same sign for all t, then the modulus of delta w j, j i delta w j i okay, that grows in magnitude. Correct. Look at this expression to confirm this. Every dou e term is having the same magnitude. So, either it is increasing in the positive direction or it is increasing in the negative direction. This is a summation term that is existing, right. So, grows in magnitude, delta w g i growing in magnitude means what? That it is, it refers to an accelerated descent, okay. So, it is an accelerated descent. It is descent no doubt, okay. it is following a steepest descent, but in an accelerated way. Okay. We are coming down after somebody has given us, us a push. So, we are coming down little faster. Okay. And uh, the other thing could be the other extreme could be that dou e dou w j i is alternating its sign with every iteration. What happens in that case? In that case if dou e dou w j i is alternating its sign with every iteration then mod of delta w j i is going to be small in magnitude is not it? Because one term is tending to add up in the positive direction the next term is going to subtract it in the negative direction. Okay. So, 
addition subtraction, addition subtraction okay, continuously happening. So, that restricts the mod of delta W g i. Now, if it is something in between, okay, that means to say that few terms are uh, having same sign, few terms are going to have opposite signs, okay, that means to say that it will be within these two extremes, but one of the extremes is going in the form of an accelerated descent and the other extreme is that if do e do w j i okay, alternates alternates its sign its sign in every iteration in that case delta w j i mod of that okay, is small in magnitude and this certainly has got a more stabilizing effect. Okay. So, what we have got as a as the momentum term is not something which uh, is risky in that sense. Okay. Even if it is an accelerated descent, but, but, but still you remember here that because alpha is restricted within 0 and 1, okay, we are not going to have an unbounded increase of delta w j i. Okay. So, definitely it is stable. So, with stability it is possible to for us to have an accelerated descent. Okay. That of course, depends on what your derivative of this uh, E term is with respect to w j i. Okay. And the other possibility is that it is small in magnitude and if it is small in magnitude then uh, I mean definitely it stabilizes. Uh, now, the momentum term uh, has got two effects not only uh, can it contribute to a faster learning as we have just now shown that means to say that possibility of the of some form of an accelerated descent. It also helps in avoiding the local minimum. Because one thing is there, you know that um, I mean again going back to our original discussion that the back propagation algorithm is an approximation to the steepest descent. And in a steepest descent, okay, the convergence to a local minimum is guaranteed. Convergence to a minimum in fact is guaranteed, but whether that is a local minimum or global minimum is not very uh, clear to us because if the surface, if the cost function surface in the multidimensional space is such that it could be having local minimum as well as global minimum, then at least the steepest descent can bring us to a local minima and uh, trap the solution in that manner. Whereas, in the case of whereas, in this case if we are adding a momentum term Okay, the momentum term has got some effect in avoiding the local minimum. In fact, uh, more on the avoidance of local minimum we are going to see when we discuss about the aspects of simulated annealing. Okay. Uh, so, uh, any uh, doubts that you are having related to the um, uh, um, uh, learning rate aspect what we uh, what we have just now presented in terms of its momentum parameter any uh, queries related to this yes so please in this first we are propagating to the output node first we are propagating our are right 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 so you are saying that after each back propagation we are doing with iterations after after every back propagation yes i mean we are uh, uh, we are first doing a forward pass then we are doing a backward pass and the backward pass is allowing us to calculate all the delta j's and then after calculating the delta j's we are calculating the delta w j i. So, only thing that we have modified is that the uh, algorithm that we have been talking so long is as if taking alpha is equal to 0. In this case you just substitute alpha is equal to 0 then it leads to the unmodified back propagation algorithm that means to say unmodified weight updating. Okay. In this case what we have simply done is that instead of doing the weight modification simply according to eta delta j i y i 
we are adding a momentum term to it. So, that we are doing after the backward pass is done, okay. that is only during the change of weight delta w j i that we are introducing this term, that certainly does not affect our forward pass or the backward pass. at output node as well as the hidden nodes we are doing the delta j computations so it will take lots of time for system to stabilize you see this is this delta w j i that we are doing we are doing it connection by connection that means to say that when the forward pass is done and then the backward pass is also completed okay i mean we are i mean when we are com uh, completing one of the nodes then we are computing its corresponding change of weights. We go to another node, compute its change of weights. Okay. So, we update the weight as we go from uh, one layer to another, I mean starting with the output layer to the next layer to the next layer like that. As we go on, we will update the weights every time. Okay. So, we have to allow for that much of computation, but certainly since we are doing this computation, certain, uh, I mean certainly it does not add to anything like a instability or anything like that. Okay. We are just taking this time, I mean, I mean there, is, there is nothing different from the original back propagation algorithm except for the fact that computationally you are introducing one more momentum term, that is all. Any other doubts? Uh -huh. uh -huh. You see, I mean, uh, that is just to show you some steps about this. Yeah. So this one, right? Yeah. So this is this is the difference equation involving n and n minus one. Likewise, I can have a difference equation involving n minus 1 and n minus 2. Okay. So, which is going to be what? Alpha times this minus alpha square terms times this okay, is equal to alpha times this. Okay. So, now if I add up these two, then what happens? Then if I, if I simply add up, then we are getting delta w g i is equal to alpha square times this plus this term. Okay. Okay. After this, yeah, this is, uh, uh, I, I, I I'll, I'll tell you, here what you are getting is delta, uh, I mean alpha eta delta j n minus 1 y j n minus 1, all right. So, you see that this is for two terms that I have got. That means to say that if I had got this for three terms, then what would have been the case? Then it would have been delta w j i n equal to alpha cube of delta w j i n minus 3 plus eta terms this, alpha into eta terms this plus alpha square into eta terms of this. Now, that means to say that ultimately you reach what? Alpha to the power n delta w j i 0 and what is delta w j i 0? It is 0. So, this term ultimately does not remain, what remains is the next term that is to say eta delta j y j plus alpha eta delta j y j plus alpha square eta delta j y j plus alpha cube eta uh, delta j y j like that it goes on and we have to sum up all these things together okay. and that is exactly what we have represented in the form of this time series. Is it clear to those who had any difficulty in following this? All right. So, this is about some form of an accelerated learning using the momentum term. Okay. And now, there is one more debate that we should initiate, that is to say that whether the sequential learning is good or the batch mode of learning is good. Right. 
Now, the discussion that we have been uh, having so long is as if to say that we are presenting one pattern, which we are calling as by the index n. That means to say that uh, when we are putting everything within bracket n means that it is the nth iteration or rather the nth pattern as if to say that we are presenting one pattern and then we are adjusting all the weights and then we are presenting the next pattern adjusting all the weights and so on followed. We will be given okay, a training set, a, a, a training sample is something that we begin with that means to say that we will be having a, a set of d and a set of x i's okay, where x i's are going to be the input vector okay, and d or rather to say d i is going to be the desired output. Okay. In fact, in this case I can say it is d i in the form of a vector also okay, meaning that uh, I mean uh, since the output is going to be from several neurons I can describe it in the form of a vector. So, I am feeding one pattern calculating its errors okay, at the outputs and then making the readjustment of the weights then only feeding the next pattern. Okay. That is the approach that we have been following and this is called as the sequential mode of training. This is sequential mode of training. Now, as we discussed last time that we definitely have a fixed set of patterns, fixed set of training patterns right? and once the system goes through the training of one set of training patterns, uh, the complete set of training patterns when that is completed we are calling that that is one epoch of learning is over. Okay. And then what we are doing is that we are I mean can we stop the network there? Certainly not because this is only once we have gone through all the set of patterns. Now we are going to repeat that epoch again repeat that epoch means that is again start with the first pattern, second pattern, third pattern with every pattern feeding you update the weight, okay, feed the next pattern like that it goes on. So, again we will be completing the second epoch, then we will be completing the third epoch and so on. Okay. Now, where to stop that is also a question that we should answer, okay. I mean what should be the stopping criteria. But coming to the question of the sequential mode of training, we are doing epoch by epoch. Now, one thing which you could have done in an alternative way is that instead of uh, adjusting the weights at every iteration, okay, if we could adjust the weight okay, once all the epochs are complete, I mean once all the patterns in the epochs are presented, then adjust the weight only once. In that case, the difference would have been that you could not have in this case, I mean in the case of sequential mode of training, what is the cost function that you are taking? It is simply the instantaneous value of the error energy. It is simply the instantaneous value of the error energy that we were considering for a sequential mode of training. And for a batch mode of training, what we would have considered? Simply the E average, E average that we had discussed few classes back, that would have been our cost function, which means to say that after computing E average, we should have taken the gradient of that E average and then would have adjusted the weights according to that. Even that way also we can derive a back propagation algorithm. So, there what happens is that the weights will be updated based on that E average once for all. That means to say once per epoch it will be adjusted. All right. Now, the debate that one can come to our mind is that whether the sequential mode of training or the one that I described just now that is to say the batch mode of training which one of these two is better. Okay. Now, 
I can uh, ask the uh, students present over here to initiate this kind of a debate. What is in your mind? Let me just hear from one or two of you about uh, your feeling. What one would you prefer? Sequential. I mean, is it a kind of a consensus in this house? Everybody feels sequential. Okay, one one good reason. I mean, any one good reason uh, for choosing sequential and rejecting the batch mode as such? Huh? Yeah. You see, I mean, uh, if I try to counter your debate by saying that, uh, okay, you are saying that with every pattern you are learning and you are contributing that incremental learning. Now, whether you uh, incorporate that learning immediately or whether you defer that learning, how does it matter? Because after all, if you are considering E average, okay, that E average also is containing the accumulated errors. Okay. So, I mean ultimately we are learning, I mean it is uh, something like this that uh, whether uh, you um, uh, read one page and then you try to assess that how much you have read, okay. with every page you do that, okay, update your learning or other thing is the, I mean other alternative is that you read the whole chapter. Okay and then only you think that what you have learned. Okay. Okay, fine, I mean I do not uh, have much of a time to continue with this uh, debate in this particular class. So, in the next, next class, we will continue this debate and find out that between the sequential mode and batch mode, which one are we going to prefer okay, and under what uh, condition. And the second discussion uh, that uh, we wanted to make is that what should be the stopping criteria for that? Okay, so, that we will do in the next class. Okay? Thank you very much.